Hey everybody, it's Dr. Venders for a little bit of um, not exactly a week four uh, overview, but some comments about week three. Uh, there are a few questions that have come up that have to do with um, religion and culture, um, uh, Protestantism, modernism. Uh, this is in the context of the 1920s. Um, and when I have a class in person, usually uh, this comes up in class. Uh, so y'all are not the only ones who are kind of confused about about what some of these terms mean and how they relate to public life. Um, and But this is also stuff that has come up um, in previous chapters. We've talked about, for example, um, Protestant immigration and Catholic immigration. We've talked about, for example, um, who are the members of the different political parties, um, who tends to be Republican, who tends to be Democrat, uh, how do Protestants split up, how do uh, Catholics split up. Um, people are familiar with a lot of these terms, but maybe are, are coming from different places about um, what they mean and what the historical context is. So just this is just a few, a few ideas to clarify some of these things. So, okay. Um, this may seem too simple, um, but let's just start at the beginning, right? So there are three main branches of Christianity, right? Um, you can think of this, this is really shorthand, um, the, the earliest branch, you can think of that as like starting at the year zero, the original uh, Christianity is called Orthodoxy, um, and that's uh, churches today, um, that's, these are the earliest uh, Christian communities in the Middle East and Egypt and Ethiopia, um, Turkey, um, the Balkan Peninsula, uh, and this, this form of Christianity spread up into, into Russia. Um, and um, so this is, this is right at the beginning. Um, and then, give or take, um, a, in 500 AD, um, there's a, a, a split in uh, this form of Christianity and the churches in Western Europe uh, organized under um, a powerful bishop called uh, the Bishop of Rome who today is known as the Pope. That's the origins of the Roman Catholic Church and that's because the the Western Roman Empire uh, politically uh, was broken up uh, and uh, the church kind of took its place, the Roman Catholic Church, but in the East uh, the Roman Empire continued and, uh, and Orthodoxy just kept chugging along. Um, and then, okay, you can fast forward another thousand years, give or take the year 1500, um, and out of the Roman Catholic Church split another movement called Protestantism. Uh, and you note that word is, uh, the, the, or, the, the root of that is protest, right? So they were upset with the Roman Catholic church governance uh, and some theology, a, a number of things, uh, and this is guys like John Calvin, Martin Luther, uh, and so there's a split um, in Northern and Western Europe in particular uh, from Roman Catholicism, um, and this is, we're talking about Germany, Switzerland, um, the British Isles, um, Scandinavia, France, um, and um, and then they kept breaking apart from each other. So first they broke apart from uh, Roman Catholicism, but then they, I mean, they're called the protesters, right? Protestants. So they kept on protesting each other too and, and, and kept splintering into more and more uh, pieces. And so this is, there are hundreds of different Protestant denominations now. Um, let's see, Baptist, Methodist, Lutheran, uh, Congregational, Reformed, Presbyterian, Episcopalian, uh, Quakers, uh, Pentecostal, Holiness, uh, even um, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, or more recent uh, breakaway groups from Protestantism. Um, so that's a, that's a, a lot of different groups. Okay, um, when we look at the United States, okay, what branch of Christianity has been the most important one in the development of the United States? Well, that depends on your geographic scope, right? So if you think about the parts of today's United States that were colonized by uh, Spain, uh, Florida, the Southwest, uh, then Roman Catholicism is the one that's most important in the colonization of that 
that part of the current U.S. Um, if you think about uh, French colonization uh, down the Mississippi Valley, uh, that's Roman Catholicism. Uh, but uh, the, the dominant religion when the English started to set up colonies, uh, the dominant religion in England was pretty much Protestantism. And so the colonies um, uh, that the, the English set up on the east coast of North America, uh, those were pro primarily Protestant. And those were the ones that formed into the United States, and so they spread their culture um, across North America. Uh, and Protestantism is the, the dominant form of Christianity since early on uh, and, uh, and, and continues to be today. Um, but there have been Roman Catholics in what's today the United States since the very beginning. Uh, there have been Jews, that is a whole nother religion, uh, in what is today the United States since the very beginning. And of course, that's not even to speak of all of the different indigenous um, Native American religions um, and the indigenous uh, African religions that came with the enslaved population. Um, and not just indigenous African religions, but uh, a substantial portion of enslaved Africans from early on were Muslims, um, another completely different religion. All right, that's I mean, religion in the United States is part of my specialty, um, so I could talk for hours and hours about this. I'm gonna try and keep it simple. All right, so what does this all have to do with uh, getting us into like the, the 1920s? Um, so there are um, controversies, intellectual controversies within Protestant theological schools, seminaries, in Europe and the United States starting in the late 19th century and going on into the early 20th century. And there's two main arguments. And this, again, this is among Protestant um, intellectuals, okay, in, in, in Protestant um, theology schools. And one controversy has to do with what they call higher criticism. And this is um, looking at, um, there are new archeological discoveries in the Middle East and they start to figure out that, oh my gosh, there are all these different historic versions of the books of the Bible. Um, and we can uh, study these ancient languages and compare these different versions. And oh my God, it looks like the Bible has changed over time. This is, we can read the Bible and amplify our faith, understand our faith better if we read it as a historic document that has grown and changed, right? That doesn't mean that we don't think it's a repository, the repository of God's word, right? But that there, there is the possibility of change in the scripture itself. The other uh, controversy also has to do with change, right? And this is the response to um, Darwinian uh, ideas about evolution, right? That um, the, the, a literal reading of the book of Genesis um, is not adequate to understanding uh, where the world and humanity comes from, right? Uh, Darwin says that, that species, he mostly talked about plants and animals, not really about people, but you get the idea. Um, species have changed over time, and so the world was not created in six literal days, but over, over thousands, millions of years, right? Um, so the controversy in these seminaries was, you know, do we hold to kind of literal, traditional uh, readings of the Bible, or do we find ways to, to harmonize um, these new scientific approaches with, with our faith, right? Can reason and faith, um, how, how, do they, how do they coexist, right? Um, and in the United States, there are these same kinds of controversies, late 19th, early 20th centuries. Um, the, the folks who say we can combine science and religion, we can accommodate ourselves to, uh, to evolution and the higher criticism and still remain good Christians, these people call themselves modernists, right? Now there are others who, who are uncomfortable with these ideas and you can call them conservatives or traditionalists, right? Um, so that term modernist has a specific meaning within 
Protestantism, all right? Modernist Protestant means that you believe in, a, you know, accommodating these new ideas in science. What makes that term complicated is that also modernism refers to this whole much bigger cultural economic phenomenon in the early 20th century. So for example, um, on page 625, if you want to look at it, the first, this is Foner, could have clarified this paragraph a little bit better. This is the first paragraph under the culture wars on 625. I'll just read it. Although many Americans embraced modern urban culture with its religious and ethnic pluralism, mass entertainment, and liberated sexual rules, others found it alarming. All right, did you get that? So modern urban culture. So we're talking about the rise of cities. We're talking about, um, we're talking about uh, religious and ethnic pluralism. It's okay, you can follow whatever religion, you can be from whatever country, um, you can still be an American and have one of these uh, different identities. Um, mass entertainment, film, uh, radio, and so forth, and liberated sexual rules. We're talking about the 1920s. There's a lot more um, opportunities in the cities. Um, these are some of the, the, the uh, uh, characteristics of what's called modern culture, right? Some people love modern culture. Other people find it quite disturbing. A lot of Americans have a little bit of both kinds of feelings. We're attracted to some aspects of it and uncomfortable with others. Um, and it's not just urban, right? You can be in the countryside um, and uh, be able to turn on a radio eventually and hear what's coming um, across the radio waves and be attracted to what you see. Or you could even be in the countryside and see the Sears catalog or McCall's magazine and be attracted to um, the, the consumer products that we associate with the 1920s, right? Um, and you can, be, um, you can be a traditional Christian and live in the city, right? You can be um, a, a traditional Christian uh, preacher and seek a, a bigger audience by taking your sermons on the radio, right? Radio is a, a characteristic of the new modern culture, but you can use the radio to <laughs> criticize the new modern culture. You see, so these lines are not so stark, right? Between rural and urban and, and modernist and, and traditionalist, right? Okay. <clears throat> There is a reaction in Protestant Christianity to modernism in the religious sense, right? Higher criticism, Darwinian evolution, and to modern urban culture. One prominent part of that reaction is called fundamentalism. Now this means something specific in the 19 teens and 20s, all right? Um, there's groups of, of uh, business people and, and religious scholars that get together and publish um, uh, a, a series of essays called The Fundamentals between like 1910 and 1915. Then in 1919, there's the formation of the World's Christian Fundamentals Association. And basically, this is a, an attempt to to push back against modernism, both kinds, right? And to shore up the, the foundations, the fundamentals of Christianity. And they, there are a number of core beliefs that they point to, all right? So you have um, the biblical inerrancy. That means that the text of the Bible is perfect. It is the precise word of God. Every word is exactly the Word of God, exactly what God inspired the writers to, to write. So you don't go messing around with the text. Um, the literal, uh, physical virgin birth of Jesus, the literal, physical crucifixion, 
and the literal physical return of Jesus. Um, we can talk about the return of Christ for days and days and days and days, um, but there's this particular vision that comes up in the 19th century that says um, Jesus is going to return soon. Um, and this affects fundamentalism in, in particular. Um, so so these, are, um, these are kind of the, some of the main bullet points of fundamentalism. Um, you can be a conservative Christian, a conservative Protestant, and not be a fundamentalist, right? Maybe you don't think those bullet points are exactly the right ones, or maybe you think that, yes, but we can still interpret the text, right? We can still look at the Bible as a historical document, but uh, so, so you can be a conservative Christian without being a fundamentalist, but if you're a fundamentalist, you're probably conservative, right? So this is a subset of conservative Christians. So what I'm trying to do is to help make sense of what is Protestantism, first of all, and then what are these divisions within it, and how does this relate to the larger American culture that's changing um, in, in the early 20th century. Um, now, this section on the culture wars um, has a number of elements in it that are all kind of interlocking, but I'd like to clarify some of this too. So for example, um, and how does this relate to these religious questions? Um, so immigration restriction um, is something that you can be a white American and a Protestant and believe in and not be a fundamentalist. Um, but if you're a fundamentalist, you may well be interested in immigration restriction. This section on the culture wars talks about the rise of the new Ku Klux Klan, right? Um, and um, a number of elements of modernist culture that it opposes, all right? So communism, socialism, um, um, uh, modernism in Protestantism, um, uh, African Americans, uh, Roman Catholics, Jews, uh, a number of these elements that they say are, um, are threatening to um, traditional America. Um, so you can be a Protestant, you can be a fundamentalist, and not be a member of the Klan, right? But if you're a member of the Klan, then your professed beliefs are to uphold traditional Protestantism. Does that make sense? Now, you can be in the clan and not be a practicing Christian, right? You can be in the clan and be a pretty godless good for nothing so and so, right? But but the 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 um, the stated purpose of the organization is to shore up traditional Americanism and traditional Protestantism. I'm trying to let you see how some of these categories overlap with each other, but there's some nuances here, right? Um, and uh, then there's discussion about the Scopes trial as well. And this is where kind of the, the new modernist culture, modern urban culture, um, and the modernist fundamentalist split uh, within Protestantism, they kind of overlap each other and Foner's treatment too, it, it, gets the, it gets the words a little bit confused. So, um, so, and this will be the last thing I say. This has gotten to be longer than I, I thought. Um, so, uh, the, the Scopes trial in 1925 in Dayton, Tennessee, uh, there's good discussion of it in, uh, in this section. Um, and it's about, you know, there's a state law that says you can't teach Darwinian evolution in public schools. Um, there were some, some interest groups, um, fundamentalist groups that pressured the legislature to adopt that law. Plenty of the legislators that voted for it didn't really care about it, but you know, politically, are you going to be, um, somebody who comes down, um, at that time, at, uh, you know, opposed to traditional Protestantism? No, it doesn't mean you really believe in the law, but you vote for it because it sort of looks good, right? Um, 
uh, it turns out that um, the, Mr. Scopes, the biology teacher, he was using a state approved textbook in the high school in Dayton that had evolution in it, right? So there's the law on the books, but then the State Board of Education approved this textbook that has Darwin in it, okay? So, so it's not like Dayton, Tennessee was some kind of backwoods, benighted um, uh, place that, that, you know, had never, had never seen a newspaper, didn't have any connection with, with science, right? They had a high school. They had some paved streets, right? It was a county seat. Um, you know, not a big place, but it was portrayed by the media when the reporters came to town for the trial. It was portrayed in this kind of exotic, backwoods, um, hillbilly, I use that term kind of guardedly because it's, it's a pejorative term sometimes. Um, you know, people that married their cousins and didn't know how to wear shoes and all of this, it, it becomes very exaggerated. This sort of rural urban split becomes exaggerated in the telling and what the folks who wanted the case to be brought against Mr. Scopes, um, the, 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 um, Chamber of Commerce people that thought up the idea, what they wanted was to show that Dayton was progressive. They wanted to show Dayton is on the map, right? We are a modern little town. But it turns out that then how Dayton was, was, uh, was portrayed uh, in, in most of the media was as backwards, right? Um, so uh, the, the, the campaign of fundamentalists um, to, uh, to get the teaching of evolution out of public schools um, it really sort of took a, um, uh, it got a lot quieter um, after the Scopes trial, right? Because of how traditional Christianity looked um, ridiculed uh, be, be in, 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 in this episode, right? Um, it's the, the, the part that uh, people remember is when William Jennings Bryan, um, the, uh, the guy who's uh, prosecuting Scopes for, for the state, um, former Secretary, U.S. Secretary of State uh, and presidential candidate, um, an intellectual, right? But a conservative Christian, not a fundamentalist, but conservative, right? Um, he, he ends up just looking like an idiot on, uh, uh, in, in, in some of the proceedings, right? Uh, when the um, defense attorney starts to question him about some Christian doctrine. So, so traditional Christianity comes out looking really silly. Um, from from this episode um, but what fundamentalists do keep up is working within denominations within the Methodist Presbyterian Baptist Episcopalian whatever denominations um, to try and get modernists out of theological schools out of the seminaries that were run by each church and that is a process that continues throughout the 20th century um, and then we'll see later when we get down to the 1970s uh, in particular, how this strain of Protestant Christianity, um, fundamentalism, comes, comes back into the political sphere, back out in public um, a little bit later on. So just remember this discussion that, that fundamentalists, um, they took a big hit um, in 1925 with scopes, they didn't go away, they just got quiet and changed their political focus, right? More inner within the denominations rather than um, spending as much time trying to influence public policy. Does that make sense? Um, I'm gonna post this, see what y'all have to think. If you've got any questions, uh, please let me know. Oh, 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 wait, the other question that came up was, um, what does Protestant fundamentalism have to do with Islamic fundamentalism? Well, Islamic fundamentalism is, as you can imagine, a whole nother story. Um, that term comes from the early 20th century in, in the United States. So it has a specific historical origin and it has to do with Protestant Christianity. But in the late 20th century, and into the 21st, when a movement within uh, within 
Islam in the Middle East, in Iran, in North Africa, uh, starts, to, especially in Saudi Arabia, emerges um, that shares a kind of literalistic approach to scripture and to law and to these are the things that you have to believe and these are the things that you have to do. It's, the details are different, but the reason when this movement in Islam emerges, the reason Westerners start to call it Islamic fundamentalism is that it, it has that same very rigid um, literalist approach, uh, much of it, that that earlier movement in Protestant Christianity in the United States had. Um, that's, a, that's a much bigger topic and we don't have time for this and what is this video getting to be, you know, half an hour long already. Um, so that'll do for now, okay? Thanks a lot, y'all. I'm enjoying working with everybody. I so wish we were in person uh, at least a little bit, but here we are. Uh, keep up the good work. See y'all.